Alrighty ho and welcome to Cast That Movie, the podcast where two nobodies go back in time and revisit a failed cinematic project from the past. Uh, we diagnose what may have gone wrong and we recast the project using a cast from that era as well as a director slash visionary. And then we go ahead and think of our own dream project and we cast that as well. We play an assortment of games. We talk some casting news and have an all around grand time. My name is Joe McDougall, and I am joined, as always, by your co-host, Tom Van Horten. Hello, Tom. Hello, Jode. What's going on, sir? Oh, you know, living the dream. Living the dream. Um, I, I'm going to apologize now. i got storm going on in the background, so if you hear some booms and thunders, that's what's going on. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit turbulent in our neck of the country right now. Uh, tornadoes sprouting up here, there, and everywhere. But uh, this just shows our dedication to uh, fulfilling our obligation to uh, this podcast that we're still on the air. <laughs> and side note to that, I should. Bring and we up... have we have families, and we're still doing this, and leaving them to their own devices <laughs> through this much. torrid weather. Yep, you know, I just said, yep, yeah, you guys figured out. If something goes wrong, just find a place to be safe. I'll be I'll be on the computer. <laughs> Son, you're the man of the house now. <laughs> yeah. Daddy's like, got a podcast. Daddy's got a podcast. You're eight. You handle it. <laughs> um, I brought this up on the um, Twin Peaks podcast. Um, I'm going in for surgery next week. Um, you know, by the time this airs, the day that this comes out, I'm that's my day of surgery. So I may not be around for the next particular uh, cast that movie, that would be you and uh, Joe Fremming, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I just wanted to bring that up that, you know, the next podcast I probably will not be a part of. We will try to soldier on without you. Oh, I'm sure it'll be more coherent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, let us first start. Do you have any uh, retractions, corrections, anything from our previous installment that you would like to address? Yeah, because we did. We, that's right. We dove high tide into the whole um, PMRC. Mm -hmm. And I touched upon it a little bit. But another listener has brought it up that um, that when Frank Zappa talked about the blank cassette ta uh, tax, right? That's really what a lot of these politicians were doing this for. They're like, hey, our wives are upset because someone said masturbate on a song. We can create this controversy and get this law quickly passed through. Um, that's really where a lot of this came from. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, I got nothing, so I say we should just uh, move on and go to our first break, uh, but we will be back very quickly thereafter to do some casting news. I got a little nugget I'd like to discuss, and then uh, we are, well, actually, you know, before we do the break, we should probably tease what we're doing today. We usually do that, don't we? We do normally do that. Man, we are just all scattershot on this episode so far. It's the seat of our pants. I blame yes. the tornadoes. Yes, yes, yes. We're a little bit uh, distracted, I guess. Um, so really quickly for the uh, uh, recast, we are going to continue with the Michael Crichton project. So we did Sphere last episode and we are moving on to, I would argue, uh, even more inferior film to that, uh, Timeline from 2003. And then Tom, why don't you quickly tell everybody what are we doing for our original dream project later in the episode? Later in the episode, we are going to be casting a movie about the 1899 baseball team known as the Cleveland Spiders. Baseball! Joe, well, you were super excited when I said we are going to do a baseball movie. Yeah, <laughs> baseball movies are their own kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's different than anything we've done before. So I am excited. It was a little tough for me, and I'll explain why when we get to it. But uh, anyway, let's do what I'd already teased like three minutes ago and go to our first break, and then we will come back with some casting news, and we will then visit 2003's Timeline. Bebop, diddly skiddly skash, a bebop squee. Let's face it, jazz music makes no sense. It's all over the place. A note here, a note there. Utter nonsense and rubbish. 
and not at all what music was meant to be until now. White Bread Software is proud to introduce the Jazz Corrector. Filter any jazz song through our patented software, and suddenly all those rogue notes and bloody insane type signatures are fixed, packaged neatly into traditional arrangements and more comfortable melodies. This technology works for recordings as early as the 1930s all the way to contemporary jazz arrangements. Casts and movie, and we are going to go on to casting news. Tom, a little bit of casting news. Casting news. Uh, casting before news. I give my nugget, do you have anything you would like to share for us to discuss? Uh, for casting, you know, some of uh, If you don't have anything, then we're going to move on, Tom. Okay. <laughs> Unless you do. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I got one. Uh, so, are you familiar with Todd McFarlane's Spawn? Dude, I love Spawn, actually. You used to read the comic? Used to read the comic. I've seen the movie with, uh... Um, John Leguizamo? Uh, John Leguizamo. I was trying to think of who the lead was, and I can't remember who the lead was at that time. I think and... it killed his career, honestly, so... What's that? I think it killed his career. Yeah, it didn't It didn't help a lot of... Yeah, it killed a lot of people's career, anyone yeah. that was in it. Um, I think, and, uh... uh like Wazamo just had an immunity built up after Super Mario Brothers, so he could make crap movies and still have a career afterwards. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, absolutely. And um, then I feel I... like I'm a little bit still in my character from the la- from the thing I just did. <laughs> 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 oh man, I gotta shake the wasp out of me or something. Um, no, we talked about wasp in the last episode. Um, <laughs> So no, uh, and then HBO had a show on it. Yep. Um, I played the, some of the video games. As a matter of fact, um, just recently got Mortal Kombat 11. Spawn is a character in that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, nice. I love Spawn. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was into comic books around the time of Spawn. I I read it some. It wasn't a huge thing for me. But the reason why I ask and bring it up is because they are making a new Spawn movie, according to Todd McFarlane. Uh, and the lead role is Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx is playing Spawn. What do you think of that? Um, I, that makes me excited, honestly. Hmm. Um, because if Jamie Foxx is involved in it, he's, you know, I mean, yeah, okay, Amazing Spider-Man 2, but that really wasn't its fault. I think everyone just had Spider-Man fatigue. It mm-hmm. wasn't a bad movie, and he wasn't bad in it at all. Um, so I think Jamie Foxx is very picky about his roles. And if he's going to play Al Simmons, then, yeah, I'm all for it. Okay. A little more – I'm I'm okay with the idea. A little more concerning for me is having Jer- Jeremy Renner as also part of the main cast, playing a detective role of some sort. Mm. Um, yeah, not as, mm. not as uh, bullish on that. But, um, mm. yeah, overall, I'll watch it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar enough with the material. And, yeah, you're right. Jamie Foxx tends to usually choose his projects well. Uh, I still, I don't know. I, do you have this with any actors? It's sometimes it's hard for me to take Jamie Foxx seriously because how I got to know him was from In Living Color. Sure. And he's more than like proved that he is a, a dramatic powerhouse as far as mm-hmm. acting. But I still, oh, it's it still lingers. Like I, I'd say even, I had that with like Robin Williams. I always yep. struggled with him in dramatic roles sometimes, even though he was a really good actor. He was a really uh, good actor. And Jim Carrey, too. Same thing. I just, yeah. Yes. You're not a Jim Carrey fan, I know. But I'm just saying it's that same, you know, same show, actually, in Living Color. But it yeah, was so uh, formative for me in my youth, you know. No, I totally get it. In uh, Living Color was great. And I did like, I want to make it very clear, I did like Jim Carrey in In Living Color. Um, I just didn't think he was ready for you know the the mainstay but actually my favorite movie of his is actually like one of my top 20 movies of all time which is eternal sunshine on a spotless mind yeah and i loved him in that role and i um took me forever to actually see it Mm. because it was jim carrey oh okay 
Mm-hmm. All right, so we are both uh, cautiously optimistic on Jamie Foxx being cast as Spawn. So uh, obviously they're not filming it yet, uh, but once they get rolling and it uh, comes together, we shall see. Uh, let us move on then to our recast. And as I mentioned earlier, we are sticking with Michael Crichton uh, source material, and we are doing 2003's Timeline, uh, starring Paul Walker, Gerard Butler, and um, Billy Connolly. Uh, Michael Sheen was in it. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget who directed it. Um, uh, no, it was Richard Donner. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty heavy-hitting cast. Tom, why don't you tell us what happened with Timeline? Oh, boy. Well, first of all, you threw me a doozy with this one because there is not there was not a lot of information. And I had to actually go deep into some rabbit holes to actually get information on it. And I think it's because um, it didn't do well. Uh, Michael Crichton himself later distanced distanced himself immediately from this movie. And um, yeah, there was just so much wrong here. Uh, Let's start with the box office totals. The budget was about eighty million, and as we've talked about, movies have to make um, double what that is in order to become profitable, right? So, if they say an eighty million dollar budget, that they make about one hundred and sixty million in order to be considered a success. Domestically, this did nineteen point five million dollars its entire run. Um, worldwide, forty three million. Um, didn't even come close. Uh, now. As I said, I had to dig into things, and I'm going to borrow heavily from a 2003 uh, November 24th article, which was an interview with Richard Donner for a lot of my information. This interview took place two days before the movie released, so what you're going to see here is is, is some of the things, but I pulled uh, some information from it, um, as well as um, Robert uh, Ebert talked about in his review how he went to see it at the Chicago press screening, and... Richard Donner and his wife showed up, um, who's the the producer of of the movie, um, Lauren Schuler, and did a little. We're going to talk about the movie beforehand, and and uh, Roger Ebert said himself, like when when filmmakers do that, I want to hide because this tells me that the movie's not good. That they're making up why this movie isn't what they wanted it to be. And they told about this long odyssey about how the movie was made, this corporate struggles, the different locations. And all these issues with it. I was like, where is this information? And um, it was nowhere except in this IGN article. So per Richard Donner himself, the problems we ran into with this film are extraordinary. First off, it was a bitch developing the screenplay, which we finally did. Then we picked a location. We could not shoot in France because everything around the Dorgan Valley um, and around that area was all built up. So you couldn't get a medieval look without spending a fortune. Uh, to you know, to take everything out with computers. We looked at locations all over Europe. We found the best one at the time in Wales. So we decided it was going to be in Wales. We are directed it for it to be in Wales. We started setting up the sites for it to be in Wales. And then we couldn't because hoof and mouth disease in England and we were asked not to go there. So they shut down a few million dollars down in the drain. Um, you know, So then they're going to shoot in a national forest outside of Berlin. Then 9-11 happened. And they didn't want to be in Berlin with such a high-profile film, so they got shut down for another six months. They went to try to do it in America, then they tried filming in Canada, um, and they finally got to themselves in uh, uh, Montreal to film the movie. Um, and, you know, IGN asked, was there any point where this could have been permanently derailed? He said, at every single point. We just spent so much money. And you wanted to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe it's just better to recoup our losses and close up shop. They lost a ton of money in Germany, lost all that money in England. They had to close down because of a strike. They had to pay people off. They had 9-11, they had all these other issues. And he said, well, how difficult was it to cast the film? And Richard Donner said, a little difficult, in that it was such an ensemble that you really wanted one to complement the other. Paul Walker was just kind of... They made him for the role (laughs) Um, because he was a really nice looking kid, Uh, not all that interested in what he was doing, um, but, you know, um, it's what it is. (laughs) And and then the only other thing of of mention of noteworthiness was he was asked uh, what was the current state of Goonies 2, and he said waiting for Warners to say yes, they're being ridiculous. 
Um, so there was a lot of problem with this. Now, Joe, I got to ask you, did you ever read this book? No. Okay. Uh, I did not read the book. Um, no, I did not. I, I, I'm trying to remember, and I don't recall that, that I ever did. Okay, so the the book, um, I actually did some research. I hadn't read this book either, but I figured if I'm going to talk about this, because one of the big things that I heard over and over on like the re- on the review sites and things like that were um, just how fucked this movie was compared to the book. Right. Uh, in the movie... Yeah, Michael- Michael Crichton is a is very much an attention to detail kind of guy, and um, you had mentioned how he didn't like this and distanced himself. He disowned this movie. Yes. In fact, he refused to let anybody else make movies of his material up until his death. Um, so that's how much Michael Crichton hated it. But go on. Okay. So you know, in the movie, they got they're using time like warp um, uh, wormholes, and it's not really time travel, but it is time travel. Um, in the book, it's all about the multiverse, and, quant- and they developed a quantum teleportation system. So they couldn't even get the science right. And, you know, there was just so many glaring differences in the book. There's a character that was made for the movie, the French translator, um, that was immediately killed, uh, just to add some tension to it. Um, yeah, it it was just a overall piece of shit to be honest with you and the writing and everything was just so awful um and uh it took three like three different screenwriters it went through three different screenwriting processes and was just a a disaster um so that's what i got there for you yeah it was just really bad it was just bad all around bad movie yeah Yeah. And it, it so, doesn't feel like a Michael Crichton movie at all. It feels like just something that a hack threw together for a certain play and, and they greenlit it. Well, that was essentially it because they wanted to do these things. Now, one of the other cool things I should say about this was that Richard Donner was adamant that the, the least amount of CGI as possible. So what he got was a bunch of uh, medieval um, reenactors. Most of those uh, people that are fighting in there are people that are warpers and do reenactments of of historical wars of of the medieval time, and um, and when they're launching off the the fireball, you know, the, the flaming um, arrows and everything, that's real flaming arrows. That's real fireballs. He tried to keep the CGI to a minimum because in two thousand three he was worried about how it was going to age. Good for Richard Donner. So let's replace him. Yes. Um, who, uh, well, you just did your whole thing, so I'll start here on, on the, uh, the, the recast, and we'll start with Richard Donner as director. Uh, so, I, yeah, it's, Richard Donner, obviously, Superman, he's had some big hits, you know, and he had his time and place, but I don't know, has he done anything worthwhile in, like, the last two, three decades? I mean, you don't you know, need to look it up, I think the answer is no. No, uh, I'm not. I'm looking it up, and uh, you know, and as we were looking that up, I also want to bring up a point of uh, with this movie. It was hard because is it sci-fi or is it, is it a medieval film? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, you know, it really. I, well, I mean, outside of Scrooge, um, which really was no. The answer is no. He hasn't done anything really since. Lethal Weapon 3. Um, yeah. I mean, Lethal Weapon 4 is there, but still, that wasn't a great Lethal Weapon movie. He was way past his prime, I guess is my point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I decided to do the opposite and go with, uh, it's actually two directors who were at the top, uh, were in their absolute prime at this time. Uh, mm-hmm. I went with the, and they, they definitely are able to uh, have a deft hand with sci-fi, I believe. Uh, I went with the Wachowski sisters. Yes. Major. They were on my short list. Hmm. They were on my short list, but I was like, you know what? I want the Matrix movies. Well, actually, it probably would have been better because then Matrix 2 and 3 wouldn't have been done instead of the timeline. <laughs> Made uh, an awesome time. And then may- Michael Crichton would have let them do another. Pr- you know, we, who knows what we might have had? We would have been stuck with the one true Matrix, but yeah. Yes. Who did um, you take for director? I went in the same direction as you did. I went with someone that's known for sci-fi that can do, um, that can direct 
um, a sword style play. Um, I went with Lawrence Kasdan. More and remind me his resume. Uh, Lawrence Kasdan, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Oh, okay. And uh, he was done. Uh, he actually did a movie in two thousand three. I can't remember what it was. Um, off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. He did Dreamcatcher. He, he directed Dreamcatcher. Oh, with the oh the Stephen King adaptation. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Under underrated, I thought. Uh, very underrated. That was a great movie. So yeah, uh, Lawrence Kasdan knows what he's doing. Sure. Uh, so then, who is your lead? Who's taking over the Paul Walker role? <sighs> okay, I'm gonna be very honest with you. This movie was so bad and so uninspiring. I struggled with this casting, really, really hard. But I eventually landed on Adam Brody. Adam Brody, huh? Mm-hmm. Was he? Oh, from The Pianist? Yep. No, no, not Adrian Brody. Oh, that's Adrian Brody. That's, Adam, a, that's Adrian Brody. Adam uh, Brody. Was he a thing at the time in 2003? He was. He actually did a movie in 2003, yes. Um, so, yeah, he was a thing, absolutely. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he so could have for... played, the, played the cauldron very easily. Yeah, he did... Um, Three movies. He did Grind, Home Security, and Missing Brendan. I've never heard of any of those movies. You didn't hear Grind? It was a horror. It was a it was a comedy um, about amateur skaters. <laughs> you started with horror, and then I know, you went I, to I, comedy. I, I, was, I know. I was my my train of thought, but yeah, he did that, and then two and then two years later, he broke out in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and okay. thank you for smoking. So he was kind of riding the indie circuit at the time. You're saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, he did American Pie two. The oh. Ring and Grind, and then went to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'll i say it. For my cast, I just took what the, the original cast and just upgraded them all. I didn't get it, do anything too crazy here. Okay. Um, so for my Chris Johnston uh, mm-hmm. to replace Paul Walker, who uh, it's not cool to speak ill of the dead, of course, but I've always found him to be a terrible actor. Well, um, he was good in what he did, and you know, in I'll give him give him his dues. The Fast and Furious movies, he didn't need a lot. He worked for the Fast and Furious movies. He did not work for this movie. No. Um, okay, well, we'll leave it there because again, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but <laughs> I have a very low opinion of his acting chops. Um, sorry, he's gone, but absolutely. Whatever. Uh, anyway, so I went with an obvious upgrade here, and somebody who I think would fit right in with this this feel he's kind of done similar projects uh, uh like the medieval type stuff but uh he's flexible that he could master any genre uh and he's also unfortunately no longer with us i went with heath ledger yeah yeah that's definitely an upgrade um i'll give you that 100 percent um so then who'd you go for your merrick so for my andre merrick uh should remind people was gerard butler pre-300 gerard butler was cast and in that role in the original timeline. <clears throat> Again, I, I went same, uh, well, just an upgrade in talent. I went with somebody we've tried to cast before. I went with James McAvoy. Mm, very nice. Yeah, Gerard, this is a tough one for me because Gerard Butler was like the one actor in this movie that I felt belonged in this movie. It was one of his better performances, to be it quite was honest. Really good. It was a really good performance, yeah. And unfortunately it was wasted on this on this movie. But yes, he was by far the out you know, he outacted everybody in every scene he was in. Hmm. Um so this was difficult for me because I didn't know where to go for that. So I went with someone I actually a little bit of a downgrade in my mind, but not that far downgraded. I went with Jeremy Davies. Oh, so you're you doing a uh, Scottish brogue then, or you'll see? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you'll see. You'll see where I'm going with this. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, interesting. So, uh, if you're those that don't know, that he's saving Private Ryan, the the coward, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, then who did you take for Professor Johnston to replace Billy Connolly? <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> I love Billy Connolly. Yeah. Oh my God, the father son. Dis- you got a guy with a heavy, you know, Irish accent, Scottish accent. And you got Paul Walker. It just didn't <laughs> work. You know what I mean? So I was thinking about. Uh, I actually 
uh, casted my Johnston first and then tried to look for someone that could work with him in that way. You're going to laugh at this one. I'm bringing back James Spader. <laughs> what do you mean bringing back James Spader? Where did in he ever leave? In 2003, dude, his dude, okay, tell me tell me what James what James what James Spader was doing in 2000. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I just didn't know that there was a lag. You see saying he oh uh James Spader, you think he's old enough? To... Oh, yeah. I think he was old enough in 2003, yeah. Well, I decided... in 78, dude. Sure. I decided to just continue doing what I was doing, so I took took Billy Connolly and upgraded him. I went with Sean Connery. Very nice. That was on my short list as well. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So Connolly who... to Connery. Yep. Yep. Who's your Lady Claire? Lady Claire. So... I forget the actress who played her, but I don't remember her being all that impressive. So I just wanted somebody. Yeah, I just wanted somebody that I don't know. It's such a. It, it, it it's not a very good role. Um. So I wanted somebody, as I usually try to do with roles like this, that would elevate the role and just put the talent in there, and then they can make it a more significant, entertaining role than it is on paper. Uh, I went with Naomi Watts. Very nice. Um, I yeah, I went this one. I considered an upgrade. I wanted someone that could be a little bit more actor. I probably would have made her a little bit more involved in some of it. Um, I went with Kira Knightley. So uh, we got Kira Knightley hooking up with Jeremy Davies. <laughs> Jeremy Davies. <laughs> yep. yep, yep. Versus my James McAvoy and Naomi Watts, which would be yeah. I know, I know. Okay, who's your Lord Oliver? Oh, no. I want your Lord Oliver. First. Okay. Fair enough. So, you've been trying to cast this guy, uh, I think, a couple times, and it just is, hasn't worked out. So, I'm going to take over here and see if we can plug him in. Uh, I went with Sean Bean. Very nice. Yep. He was on my short list, but I remember, I thought I did cast him. I thought we went with him. So, I, I was like, oh, can't use him. So, I went with someone that can I love that you love um, that could play a villain, um, but also make it captivating. Mm -hmm. I went with the late great Bill Paxton. Oh, Oh, okay. Let's talk about our picks here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Let's. All right. So for director, we got the Wachowski sisters versus Lawrence Kasdan. Oh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. It, that is a tough one because they could both do it. Um, it really comes down to what are you, I mean, with the Wachowski sisters, you're going to get something that's more sleek or modern. Um, you know, Lawrence Kasdan, obviously an old school director, uh, which is kind of what we had with Richard Donner. Mm-hmm. So I think we go with you. I mean, I think you're going to win a lot of this one, but we're going to go with yours because I think, uh, you know, again, it's a different direction. I think Lawrence has, and we would have gotten somewhat of the same. Sure. Okay. Okay. So moving on then, uh, Chris Johnston, uh, I had Heath Ledger and you had, uh, uh, Adam Brody. No, not Adrian. <laughs> I had Adam Brody. Uh, God, how old was Keith Ledger in 2003? 2003 would have been right around Knight's Tale. Which is kind of why I thought of him. Uh-huh. Yeah. He would have been in his uh, what, late twenties, early thirties. Yeah. See, that was the one thing because, like, you know, this is supposed to be about college students, and oh. uh, you, you, you know what I mean. And that's why I just I wonder if if Heath Ledger's a little too old for the role. Sure, and I wouldn't mind saving him for sure for a better project anyway. Yeah, I sure. can't well, think of anything else we're gonna cast Adam Brody in, so might as right. well go with it. So yeah, we'll give it to Adrian Brody's brother. Yeah, um, hey. I don't know. Are they brothers? Actually, I don't. Uh, I don't know if there's any relation. Uh, who cares? Uh, anyway, Andre Merrick. I had. <laughs> we take the show so seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, James McAvoy. You had Jeremy Davies. <laughs> oh, dude, you put them in there. Uh, James McAvoy. Yeah, I'm gonna go with James McAvoy. Win. Yeah, take him. Th- put him in. This would have. This would have been. Um, uh, before James McAvoy had broken out, kind of similar to Gerard Butler in that way. Like this was after he was on the British Shameless, so he mm-hmm. was uh, he was established. He uh, I think this is right around when he did that Children of Dune miniseries. 
Um, well, did the Children of Dune, I think it was, well, that's when it came out, but he was filming like 2001. That Dune miniseries was before he broke out in um, Shameless. So, well, he didn't really he didn't really break out in Shameless. I'd say uh, he broke out in uh, I forget the name. It was a movie in the mid mid aughts, but um, but yeah, regardless, he's already in acting. You know, yes, he's, he he's got a career. He'd have been you know, uh, I mean, I guess him and Adam Brody would have both been you know, kind of their big break type deals. Yes. So, um, yep. Oh we, no, I totally take it. I totally yeah. Yep. All right. So he's moving on would have been awesome. Moving on, Professor Johnston, I got Sean Connery, and, and you're, I, got, uh, I got soft course James Spader. <laughs> you're bringing back James Spader. Bringing back James Spader. I mean, I brought back the Gutenberg. Um, hmm. Yeah. Do we want to waste Connery for this? Kinda, because if we want this to work, we need at least some kind of a name talent, and we're going with two no-name leads. Yeah, no. So kind of like I, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen type thing where you can have a bunch of no-name guys playing all the bit roles and then you got Sean Connery you can throw on the poster. Yeah, just like the passing of the torch type of thing, which I tried to do with that one. All right, I'll give it to you. We'll go with Connery. All right. Plus, I don't know. I I like James Spader, actually, and kind of would like to save him for something else personally. Fair enough. I, I love James Spader, actually. I really enjoy him. He's He's got a certain... Uh, thing about him that certain roles would be very ideal. I just I just don't see it for this. Um, la- Lady Claire, Naomi Watts, and you had I had Kira Knightley. We're Naomi Karen. Watts done over. Oh, I was prepared to concede on that. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'll, le- I'll leave oh, it up oh, to you. If you no, if you, no. Let's hear it. why 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 um well, why I, not Naomi Watts and over? I mean, why do you have? Uh, Keira Knightley over Naomi Watts. I think Naomi Watts is a way better actress and is better than this material. Ooh, 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 ooh. I disagree there. I am a huge Naomi Watts fan. But that's also because she does a lot of Lynch movies. Well, I just said she's a way better actress. I'm not talking oh. shit about her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay, yes, let's save Naomi Watts then, please. So, yes, we'll give it to Keira Knightley. Okay. I mean, Keira Knightley is nothing to sneeze at. She's uh-huh. definitely talented. She just yes. doesn't have – I mean, I, I, I could see us using Naomi Watts in other projects. I don't know. I, I just yes. want to save her if we can. No, so I'm agreed. Gonna, I'm, gonna I'm totally on, down for that. Yes, agreed. Okay. Okay, we're on the same page. Lord Oliver. Um, so, Sean Bean, I know we didn't use him for the one I couldn't remember who he was briefly – yeah. Uh, right. Uh, what was the other? Uh, what was the other project we that you introduced? No, him I for? thought it was that one. I thought I thought we took him in that one. I that was like one of our first podcasts. So that's been months ago now. So yeah. I, I yeah I don't remember, but I remember bringing him up. So I didn't want to bring him up again. Sure. Um, I'm I, I can't I can't let Bill Paxton be Lord Oliver be in this movie, <laughs> and that's can't use Bill Paxton again. Did you see him though? I mean, to be honest, he'd be in a great Lord Oliver, right? He really would have. No, he wouldn't have, because <laughs> I don't know that he can even do a British accent convincingly, and <laughs> it would have been joke casting. I don't think the Wachowski sisters are going to put Bill Paxton. All right, fair enough. All right, all right, then we are going to go. Ah. <laughs> right. Yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> Jesus. Who are these motherfuckers in my motherfucking castle? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that's enough for timeline. I think we got a, a, a definitely respectable cast and crew together that would uh, that would have made something that uh, people wouldn't have forgotten had existed uh, 17 years later, which is the case now. I, I, I forgot about it until... I was looking into Sphere. I forgot this was even a movie that I'd seen once upon a time. I'd seen it too, and I forgot about it. And, you know, it, that's something to say. I mean, this thing's sitting at 11% of Rotten Tomatoes. And, again, I think the same problems that that we that um, Dustin Hoffman brought up in Sphere mm-hmm. is the same issues with this one. Is it a sci-fi? Is it medieval? Is it what? – what are you trying to do with this? Like, this is a hard movie, I think, to – put in and get together and when you have no style you mm-hmm. you can't i mean that's one thing with the wakowski sisters is they got style Absolutely. and that would have that would have been able to marry things i think together a little better it's just clunky and boring and 
just really bad. Just really yeah. bad. It was so really bad. So we're done with that. We're, we, we, we fixed it, as we always do, and now we're going to take a break. Then we're going to come back and play a little game. Game time. Game time. And then we're going to talk some baseball. All um, right. We'll be back next Are you thirsting for your annual fantasy football league, but you have no faith in games ever being played this year because of you-know-what? How can you draft a team when these pansies are opting out left and right? And what happens when the first O-line coach kicks it, or the one of those fat reps kicks it? It's time to reimagine fantasy sports and sign up on Gridiron Gambit's new weekly fantasy app, Will They, Won't They?, where players gain points by correctly guessing which teams will be able to play that week and which teams will be under quarantine. Look, these are trying times. We've lost a lot. There's no reason to lose fantasy gambling on top of everything else, right? Sign up for Will They, Won't They? now, and you'll receive a custom mask in the mail featuring your favorite NFL team. This is America. And this is the most American solution to the most American thing. America. Welcome back to Cast That Movie, and it is game time. Game time, Tom. Game time. Game time. Game time. Pants off. Game time. Game time. All right. So this week... uh, I'll admit, I think I teased the new game last week we were going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I forgot about that until just we, while the, in the break, you mentioned it to me. <laughs> um, so, God. Oh, man. Hopefully people are finding humor in just how inept we are this this episode. But uh, uh, whatever. Uh, anyway, so we don't have a new game. <laughs> no. I. You know what? I'm going to blame it, again, on the tornadoes, on the weather. And I'm also going to blame it on the fact that we have known for a while that I was going to have this surgery. Mm-hmm. So things were up in the air as to when I was going to have the surgery. So we weren't even sure if I was going to be on this episode or not. Right. Yeah. It yeah. was just a lot of moving parts. So uh, yes. I'm not going to promise a new game anytime ever again until I am absolutely certain. But we do have another top three list, though. And I think it's one that people will like. It's our top three movies featuring dogs, puppies, puppies, puppies. So let's uh, let's start here. Uh, you want to go first, or or shall I with my number three pick? Why don't you unleash the puppies first? All right, puppy puppy time. All right. So my number three pick is a classic dog movie. Uh, now, now dog movies for the most part, when you think of a dog movie, you think of family entertainment. You know, the, uh, dog movies have a, a certain um, reputation, right? Yeah. Um, for the most part, and my, uh, my number three pick is no exception, uh, and it is. One that most people think is not as good as another movie that is similar, but I like it better. It's Iron Will. Oh, you like Iron? Okay, mine. As opposed to White Fang, I should. Yep, uh, as opposed to White right Fang. Mm-hmm. I, I can get behind that. I can do that. My number three dog movie is one that I picked mostly for nostalgia, because I liked it when I was much younger, mm-hmm. and um, it's just you know it's one of those movies that when I was a kid that just stuck with me. Milo and Otis. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. There was a lot of those that I almost, that almost made my list. My number two pick is purely a nostalgia pick. Um, so I'll go into that now. And then I'm going to tell you, let's like an example of a couple others that for nostalgia reasons almost made it, but didn't. Uh, so my number two pick is old yeller. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, one of those movies that I watched a bajillion times when I was young. Uh, but other movies like um, Homeward Bound, uh, even Beethoven. I mean, those are movies I was like a little kid when they came out and I watched them to death and, you know, still have kind of a fondness for. But um, so they almost, you know, one of those almost snuck into like number three. But Iron Will is just a better movie. And it's one that I like now, even watching as much as I like when I first did. Yeah, I'll agree with you. Um, you know, uh, um, Homeward Bound was on my list. Um, Benji was on my, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, these are all things out of nostalgia that I was really for, but, um, so, uh, old yeller is yours. My number two, um, is a movie that I I liked as a kid. I don't think the humor is there much anymore, but it's still at the time was a great movie, uh, for its time. Turner and Hooch. 
Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Tom Hanks, yeah. Tom Hanks, Turner and Hooch, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely counts because Hooch was in the uh, was the second biggest star in that movie. Yes. Um, okay, so my number one pick is nothing like my first two picks. Uh, nothing like most dog movies. Uh, but dogs are the central um, focus of the film. It is best in show, Tom. Best <laughs> we have the same one. We yeah, same. I figured. I yes. figured we would. Mm-hmm. I figured once we all looked at our when we Google dog movies and that pops up, you know, it's like, yeah. oh my God, this is like way better than any of these other movies. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah. Best in show. Phenomenal movie. Absolutely love it. Um, all right. Yeah. Those are our three favorite dog movies. <laughs> so <laughs> let's move on uh, to our original <laughs> dream project. Uh, which is all about the Cleveland Spiders of, was it 1899? We're going way the fuck back in time for this one. Way the fuck back in time. So when we were looking for things, you know, I, I really enjoyed kind of getting into the whole story, the, the historical aspect, aspect of doing the PMRC that we did last week. And uh, so one of the things I decided was we haven't really focused on as a, as original project was sports. So I went on a hunt uh, and for the worst sports team in history. And I found it in the 1899 Cleveland Spiders, um, that particular season. Uh, are you familiar at all with the Cleveland Spiders, sir? No, I've never heard of them. Well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, let's talk about what went on here. So uh, the, in the 1899 Cleveland Spiders were a baseball team. And uh, the particular that year, it was their 13th and final season in the Major League Baseballs and their 11th season in the National League. What happened was that in 1899, the owners of the Spiders, the Robinson brothers, Frank Robinson and Stanley Robinson, bought a competing team, the St. Louis Browns, from Chris Vondier and renamed it the um, St. Louis Perfectos. Now... They continued to retain ownership of the Cleveland Club, Cub, uh, Club, which was an obvious conflict of interest. But they did it. So Stanley Robinson publicly announced his intention to run the Spiders, quote, as a sideshow. Oh, my God. <laughs> yep. This was going to be a sideshow, and they were going to focus on the St. Louis, uh, I mean, the St. Louis Perfectos. To give you an idea... Cy Young, his first team was the Cleveland Spiders. Uh, uh, you know, you had um, uh, there was a lot of other uh, great players on that team that were taken off from the Cleveland Spiders and moved to the Perfectos. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, to give you an idea, after the first sixteen home games, Cleveland total attendance was three thousand one hundred seventy nine people. For uh, I for an average of 199 people per game showed up to this to the uh, Cleveland Spiders. The other what's that? I said okay. Yep. So other and so other uh, and uh, National League teams responded by refusing to travel to the Cleveland's League Park since it cut into their ticket revenues since they weren't getting enough people. So as a result for that season, the Spiders only play 26 home games. <laughs> only 26 more home games for the rest of the season, including uh, only eight after July 1st. In doing so, they sent a number of negative records, including this one, 100 of run road losses that's unbreakable under Major League Baseball's current schedule. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. We should explain, because baseball i mean this year being an exception but baseball seasons are 162 games 81 home 81 away so mm-hmm. yep so no one can beat this so their final rec- record for the season was 20 wins 134 losses for a win ratio of 0.13 and it's still the worst in major league baseball so yeah, you know, this is crazy because people think Cy Young, all this stuff. Well, he debuted with the team, and then he was taken out, and so, um, you know, was moved over there. They had a coach, uh, a, 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 they had two player managers, actually, that were players and managers. And they took the first player manager, who was really good, um, Lava Cave, and moved him 
and brought back a guy who had retired because he couldn't do it anymore to be the to be the fucking player manager for the fucking spiders. Um, so because of this, because of this, it is it is now illegal for for coaches or for owners to own more than one team. It is because of the Cleveland Spiders that the that the, they came together and said, "This is no longer allowed. This is outlawed. You own one club. That is it." Um. So what all went down um, on this one? So, Jim Jim Huey was was their winningest pitcher, holds the record for most pitching losses in a single season of thirty. <laughs> Their first baseman, who Tommy Tucker had also retired, was convinced to come back. Um, Larry Lockheed, who played shortstop, he batted a .238 average and made 81 errors. Arguably the worst player on the team, so of course he appeared in more games than anyone else. 148 of the 154 Spider games. Um, tidbit. He died of liver complications at the age of 33 a month after getting lost in the desert. This was some crazy shit. Um, they're also known uh, for having um, a baseball player by the name of Louis um, Sox Alexis, who was the first Native American ever to be allowed in national in American national baseball. And it is the if you ask the Cleveland Indians. That is where they got the name from was because of Louis um, Sox Alexis. Fuck that shit. That's, I'm just telling you what they say, man. I'm just I telling know. you what they say. Fuck them. Okay, anyway. So, yeah, um, I, I pulled up some stats here. Uh, Jimmy, Jim Hooley, who I mentioned earlier, <laughs> was their winningest pitcher at an ERA of 5.41, dude. Well, I mean, that's not terrible. I mean, that's not good, but it's not like I mean, if it was like eight or nine, then you're. But yeah, that's. I mean, I guess that's pretty bad for your ace. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad for your ace because that their non ace was ten point thirteen. <laughs> there we go. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, another one, eight point seventeen. Um, there was another guy nine <laughs> who's only allowed to play once. <laughs> <laughs> this was just a ridiculous thing. So yeah, I think this could be an amazing movie to just is, watch. Is is there any? Did you find any relation to Major League, the movie Major League? Because I didn't. Kind of mm -hmm. the plot there is they wanted to put together the worst team, uh, so she could sell the team to someone else. To I forget where. Well, and it's about them, so I'm sure whoever wrote the movie was in on it, but no, I've not, no one's made, and it's, I'm glad you brought that up because no one's made that distinction of, of that. Um, so yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right. You have anything more to add then, or shall we start uh, putting <laughs> this cast together? I mean, I don't know if there's much else I could fucking add to this story, dude. All right, well, let's do it then. So let's start first with who is helming this project. Do um, you want to go first, or do you no, want me to I'll go let first? you know. I just did a whole bunch of talking. You go. Yeah, fair enough. All right, so for my director, um, I, you know, is there anything more American than baseball and apple pie? Uh, I wanted a comfort, com comfortable presence helming my project. Uh, somebody who's done baseball movies i went with tom hanks very nice okay and we can still use him as an actor down the road just to be clear to everybody if we do i don't know who you pick but if we do go with tom hanks he can still be cast in a role uh down the road so tom hanks so i can't remember i picked one but i can't remember if we went with them or not so i also picked a secondary if this didn't work Okay. Um, or if, we, if you called foul, I went with the Coen brothers because I want this to just be a bizarre thing about this club. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. That's a good question, man. We should like keep track of what we pick, <laughs> right? what we pick for our projects here. Fuck. Um, okay. Ah, uh, damn. Okay. Well, we'll talk about it. Moving on then. Your Stanley Robison. Robison. Uh, yes. Who's your Stanley Robison? 
I went, okay, so these guys, you know, are, I mean, my, my movie's obviously a comedy. I think your movie's a comedy as well. Yeah, well, League of Their Own type. Yep, yep, yeah. League of Their Own. To me, this is more like batshit. Like, I, I, I see this, instead of being uh, more of a League of Their Own, I see this being like fucking um, uh, Major League, but everyone's fucking on crack. <laughs> the way I really determined this. Well, cocaine so, was in the Coca Cola back in those co- days, right? Yes, yes, and you could get a, uh, you could get a, a pers- you could go over the counter and get some heroin. So it was very easy to do. Boy, um, go to the store and get me some Coca Cola and some smack. <laughs> get it done now. <laughs> Papa's got a game tonight. And right. speaking of that voice, I think I could get someone who kind of not quite as high pitch. But someone who could get that cadence really well, I went with Paul Giamatti. Okay. So this was tough for me because I didn't know the story. I, I, you know, I'm careful not to look too much because I like to learn as you're telling the story mm-hmm. on these things. But I did need to look up and at least Google these people because I needed sure. some kind of a – I didn't need a, a spot-on resemblance, but just a loose idea of what they might have looked like. Mm-hmm. Um, but – it was hard to find. I, I got a good picture of Frank, and I did cast accordingly there. Stanley, I couldn't find anything um, that would have been this for me. It was the opposite for me. Okay. Uh, so for me, uh, I went with uh, the, the father-son thing. I went with Colin Hanks in the nice. role of Stanley Robinson. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Are we, are we doing Stanley or Frank first? I'm sorry. Or did you do Frank? I did Frank first. Oh, shit. Okay. God damn, man. I'm sorry. Uh, are, dude. No, 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 no. You're you're fine. I should have been listening closer. Uh, okay. Well, so we've spoiled my Stanley. Um, so now I'll give you my Frank, my yeah, Frank Robinson. And to be clear, not Frank Robinson. It's a whole yes. different person. A whole yep. different story. Uh, whole Frank Ro- story. Frank Robinson. Yes, you're correct. That is the one I could find the younger picture. And so for that role, I went with Matthew Rees. I don't know if you know him, but he was uh, on the Americans, uh, the lead male okay. on the Americans. He's also the new Perry Mason on HBO's Perry yes, Mason. Yes, 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 I know. Who and he and he worked with Tom Hanks on "It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood." He was Tom Hanks' main co-star in that. Nice. So nice. keeping it kind of in the family, as you already could uh, are, are aware for my other pick. So I won't. Yep. Uh, uh, Colin Hanks again is my Stanley. So let's go to your Stanley Robinson. Okay, so Stanley was the one I could find a picture of. Frank was the one I couldn't. All I found was a sketch. Of yes, Frank. a sketch. But yes. I, I I couldn't find a picture of Stanley from that era. Like it looked, the one I saw, which is I think the one you probably saw, it looked like it was well after 1899. He was an older man, and that's the one I went off of. Um, because I do picture these, you know, if you're an owner of a baseball team, you're typically older in my mind. Um, so I went with Stanley Tucci. Okay. So Stan- mm-hmm. <laughs> Stanley uh, Tucci and Paul, Paul Giamatti, Giamatti. Yep. versus my much younger Colin Hanks and Matthew Reese combo. Correct. Uh, all right. Fair enough. Uh, so then we are moving. Let's do Louis Sox Alexis. Yes, Louis Sox Alexis. Who do you have as your Louis Sox Alexis? Okay, so I I was able to get that he was Native American, you know, and definitely wanted to cast accordingly. If I had come and said Brad Pitt right here, it would have been a problem. <laughs> um, Did you, are you going with Heather Locklear? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I it, it is maybe as equally uh, distasteful a Native American. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Uh, you've tried to cast him before. Uh, I want Jason Momoa, who is technically Native American because he's Native Hawaiian or yeah, part Native. That's more Samoan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> semantics, my friend. Right. I went with a guy who, uh, you know, um, been around for a while. Um, you might remember him as the little boy uh, Otter, uh, 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 Otter in Dances with Wolves. I went with Michael Spears. Is he still acting? Like, what's he is he still acting. Michael Spears is still acting. Right. What's he done? Like, what's he been in? How would I well, know him now? Let me let me pull it up here, sir. Because, um, yeah, he does. Um, he is most recently was in Z Nation. Um, he was in, uh, he was also in Ballad of Lefty Brown. He was in The Activist, Angels and Stardust, Winter in the Blood, Gun Girls and Gambling. He's really stayed to, like, the indie circuit. Mm-hmm. Yep, long he was in the show Longmere. Um, okay. so yeah, he's still what's, around. What's his what's his age now? So eighty nine he'd have been a kid. 
Yep. So he was born in 77. Little so little. a couple of years older than us. Huh. And, and Frank Lock, Sox Aloxis was uh, an older, like 40, 40, late 30s. He, he was old. in his, well, he was in his early 30s. But if you looked at Michael Spears now, you he he can he looks young enough to play the role. Okay, <laughs> so let's uh, get on to the two managers, and we're going to cast these roles also. Uh, yes. uh, he said it was a pretty funny uh, subplot there. So, how do you pronounce uh, Lave Lave Lavey Cross? Is it? I pronounce it Lave Cross, but it could be Lavey. Okay, so who do you have for this role? Okay, so as I talked about, Lavey Cross was the good was the one that was really good and they took him and put him on the perfectos. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to portray this as this really awesome player. I picked Chris Evans. Okay. All right. I went uh, with Shia LaBeouf. I'm not even going to do a ramp up to it. It was Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, quite honestly, uh, we'll get to it, but I think we're going to go pretty much all of your cast here. <laughs> okay. um, we'll talk about why. Maybe I have an outside chance with the last one with Joe Quinn. Uh, mm -hmm. You did see Joe Quinn is Australian, correct? I did see that, yes. Okay. Um, not saying you need to pick an Australian actor, but I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I went with uh, Liam Hemsworth for this role. Okay, and I went with Seth Rogen. <laughs> 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 because I really wanted to accentuate the whole, you got this awesome dude, or oh, we're putting him on the good team, you get Seth Rogen. <laughs> <laughs> oh man did we not do we cast him for something else i can't remember probably i not. think we used him i don't i think we used him but he didn't win mm. mm -hmm. fair enough okay yeah i think down the line uh i will say for my director yeah um i wanted you know i, I obviously came at it from a different point of view than you did and as you like gave your reasoning, I kind of fell in love with your vision a little bit of the Coens doing it, Where Art Thou style. Yes! <laughs> um, just really, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm blanking on other co comedy works that they've done, but um, the Buster Scruggs kind of style of comedy. <laughs> yes, I love Buster Scruggs, dude. Yeah, I, I, I would get in for that. And that being said, I think your cast down the line is probably better for it. Um, Whoa. I'm trying to think if there's any that I want to fight for, um, but putting the Coens in charge, I don't, I, I wouldn't mind saving Matthew Reese anyway, because I really like him as an actor. Okay. Uh, Colin Hanks, I wouldn't mind losing, but I don't, if it's not his dad directing, I don't, well, I shouldn't say that he did star in the first season of Fargo, but I think it'd be a weird pairing with, it would be him and who would it be Giamatti or would it be Tushi? No, it'd be Tushi. Yeah, that'd be a, that'd as brothers, I don't think anybody would buy that. So I think it's a package deal, one or the other. Um, so, yeah, we'll go with your package deal for the brothers. Uh, they, they could definitely do it Cohen style, uh, the Cohen style justice for sure. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, is that I think Jason Momoa, is, you know, again, this is will be a team of misfits. I think he's too big and burly to yeah. be a misfit. Yeah. I've never heard of your guy, but uh, he's he's in, starring in a Cohen Brothers movie, so he better <laughs> learn how to act quick. <laughs> <laughs> you know you, you don't remember otter <laughs> i mean no okay but but um what was he's like 10 at the time i don't think yeah, that'd be a that. yeah it wouldn't be a, a very good gauge of where he'd be at now but whatever he's got the role because i picked terribly um so then for the two uh team managers player managers um, I had Shia LaBeouf and liam hemsworth you had chris evans and joe <laughs> seth, seth rogan okay. <laughs> um Here's my question. Would you rather burn Chris Evans on this or Shia LaBeouf? Because both would be believable as the athletic one. Mm. Do you think Shia LaBeouf would be his? I, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm okay with burning. I'll be honest with you. I'm okay with burning Chris Evans on this one. Um, because to me, this is like, I want to see this movie, right? And I just think the X, the, the, again, having Chris Evans go from a player manager and all that, you know, being like, yeah, oh, no, you're going to just be good. Just an Adonis. <laughs> yeah. Just an Adonis. And then he's just, just an Adonis. The <laughs> yes, exactly. I think that would be brilliant casting. Great so, sense of humor. I don't know if you've seen Knives Out. But he, could, he, could, he could do a role like this, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen Knives Out. I love Knives Out. 
And yeah, he could do this role very, very easily. So I, yeah, wow. Is this our first time that someone's ever swept? First sweep, yes. First sweep goes to me. Holy fuck. I did not expect that, but yeah, um, I would. I really want to see this movie, dude. Someone needs to make this. Even if it's not this cast or whatever, this story is so full of everything. I mean, this could be a great series. Um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, there's just so much material here in everything that went on in this fucking theme that nobody remembers from 100 years ago. <laughs> All right, well, that'll do it for the Cleveland Spiders. Uh, should be, that would be a very entertaining film. But we are going to go to our last break and come back and say our goodbyes. Be well, back in a minute. The future, just a fever dream. Past thing, but I Since we all know about the plot against Mind Fear Trump and those crybaby crisis actors, Swole Bodies Jim is back in business of giving you the business, and we want that business booming again. Uh, we do? That's what our Twatter fans have been saying, and we at Swole Bodies listened. So, starting now, we're introducing our new 300 square foot sauna boxes. We just bought a brand new 300 square location at 8722 Santa Monica Boulevard and turned it into a brand new state of the art workout location. Do you think this is what our forefathers were thinking when they set up the American dream? Who? Yeah, I don't think so. Glad you asked, Macho Van Horton. What we've done is left it a fully empty building except for 18 sauna barrels. For you, along with our new exclusive Swole Bodies 80-minute cardio workout drills playing on a wall, a flat screens over and over and over. It's so you can fit as many Swole Bodiesers in as possible. This sounds like unnecessary hot dog in a grandstand in. Oh, it's necessary because our Swole Bodyites say we need to set an example. And that example is to get as many people together as possible and stick it to these fakers at only $973.47 every three days. The madness is running wild. <coughs> oh, Ugh. At Swole Body's Gym in Santa Monica, where gains get got and fake viruses get caught. Don't give me your... Welcome back to Cast That Movie, and we are about to say our goodbyes. And it looks like we're going to be saying goodbye to you for at least one episode, Tom. Yes, that is the case. Um, I will be out for the next episode. So uh, that being the case, we do not know. The only thing we do know is I will be here and Joe will be here in your stead. Uh, we do not know what projects we're going to do uh, as far as the recast or the dream project or if we're going to do a retrospective. We don't know yet. So that's all in the works and being figured out. But the good news is it's going to be a complete and total surprise when it is unleashed upon the public in two weeks. Which I'm actually excited for because I'll probably be uh, – um, I, you know, real quick question, uh, you know, going pulling the curtain back a little bit here. Are you going to be editing that one or are we going to have someone else edit it? Or do you guys, do you guys want to have me edit it? Oh, I can edit it if it comes to okay, it. Perfect, because if that's the case, that I'm super excited because I'm going to have no idea what you guys are doing. Nice. All right, fair enough. Uh, so that being said, uh, we'll really quick let you guys know there are other podcasts out there that we do. Uh, we do an Office podcast uh, where we watch each and every episode of The Office. Uh, Paul has never seen the office before uh and paul is related to tom somehow um <laughs> for those who listen to this podcast have probably figured out uh but tom uh you and i do that it's called it's called bears beats bobbleheads talking office it's available on most major well a few of the major formats we'll be adding more in the future but check it out find it tom yep. <laughs> go ahead <laughs> Oh, yes. So, yes. Um, yes, my, my my brother, Paul, will be doing that one, <laughs> along with your brother, Scott, will be doing that one. <laughs> oh, man. Or is that nice. my cousin? Or is he more your cousin? I can't remember. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I also do the um, Twin Peaks podcast. That one is actually going to go on hiatus um, until my surgery is back. Uh, we just stopped at episode six. Or of or part six of the return, um, and 
there just isn't a way for us to be able to do that one um, while I'm out. So we've already explained to the viewers there that will be out. Um, and remind, then, remind everybody what the name of that podcast is. Yeah, sorry. It's um, Podcast Above a Convenience Store Talking Twin Peaks. Um, and that's found on um, pretty much all major um, podcasts, uh, Apple, iTunes, Google, um, SoundCloud. Um, it's also all these, all of everything that you hear can also be found at the Joe Down dot blog where all of our stuff gets housed. Yep. 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 All right. Well, Tom, be, uh, uh, have a good search. <laughs> I don't know how that. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah, no, no, that, that, I think that's the best way you can do it. Have a good surgery, buddy. Um, yeah, you know, I'm actually kind of looking forward to a spinal uh, uh, epidural, I, you know, so that should be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Just let me know how that feels. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully I won't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so morbid all of a sudden. All right, well, you'll be fine, and then you'll be back uh, the episode after next. But, uh, yeah, check us out next episode, and... Find out what Joe and I come up with, and then we'll be back to normal, I think, hopefully after that. But uh, we, sh- we should be. Time will tell, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll figure it out as we need to, because that's what we do best is, is work on the fly, as we <laughs> proved so well in this episode. episode. This episode is by far our most improv episode of all time. <laughs> I'll be, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit. Dude, I forgot to cast a director for for the baseball movie. So while, we were, while, we were, while I was discussing it, I was looking up directors. <laughs> and you just pulled the Coens out of your ass? I pulled the Coens out of and my ass. And then you sweep it, too, and then I give you all of it. Like, you must have put a lot of thought into this. This is a great idea. Yeah. No, oh. I, I – well, I did because I, I remember them being who I wanted. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't remember as I was going through this. I was panicking. So I was like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Come on, brothers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that should do it for us here on Cast That Movie. Uh, I'm in my basement, so I have to go up and see if there's still an upstairs uh, or if a tornado has taken it and my family away. Right. Um, but uh, we will be back next uh, uh, next episode in two weeks, as always. It'll be me and Joe, and we'll be doing something. Uh, until then. Uh, Take care and uh, prosper. I don't know. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Fun episode. It was a sloppy show, but those moments can be really funny.